listening to This Side of the Ceiling. Join us as we open up the Bible and invite the Holy Spirit to teach us. I'm Jill. And I'm Kelsey. As Christians, we've been told that in this world we will have trouble. But we take heart that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness on this side of the ceiling. Welcome to this side of the ceiling. And you find us in a study of interactions with Jesus. Um, And today we have a one not quite as heavy as last week. Last week we talked about Jesus and Satan, which we have to battle. So we learned a lot from him. But this week is one I confess I've thought about a lot because... This is an interaction that Jesus has, and we're going to look at interactions, but that's probably the person that knew him better than anybody. Yes, that would be his mother. Yeah. Mary. And since you and I are both mothers, mm-hmm. it's, it's easy to put yourself in that role um, and think, what would I have thought? Right. I, I used to think that it would have been such an honor, you know, because the angel comes and says, oh, you're esteemed more than anyone. And we kind of make a big deal about that in the Christmas story. But then the more you think about Mary, she would have been shunned because no one's going to believe that she had, was a virgin. Right. Joseph doesn't even believe. She has to give birth by herself without her mother, <laughs> away from home. And then she has to raise the son of God. The son of God. Mm-hmm. And it says, you know, that she meets the old man that says it's going to pierce your heart too. She, we're going to see she watches him die. So she is the one person that is there at his birth and that is also there at his death. So it, um, she has a lot of interactions with him. Right. But uh, we're going to kind of skip the birth because that's not, we don't learn a whole lot about Jesus there. Right. (laughs) Um, But there is one little story that we get of Jesus as a young child. And... Joseph is in the picture, so it's the intact family, and for whatever reason, Joseph disappears after the story, so most scholars believe he must have passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's start this story by looking at this interaction that Mary has with young Jesus in Luke 2, 41 through 51. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Okay, so, you know, we have this story of Mary and Joseph and the whole family traveling to Jerusalem. Now, this would have been something they did every year because they were going to celebrate the Feast of the Passover. Um, and I just think we have to stop right there and what think about how um, nice it is that we ha- serve a God who wants us to stop and celebrate. We're gonna talk about that kind of a lot tonight, but or the idea that we are commanded to celebrate, the Jewish people were commanded to celebrate seven times a year. They had these feasts, and this was one of the big ones because they would all go to travel together. And I, I think that probably the kids really looked forward to that. Right, with all the cousins and siblings. Yeah, and, and just they probably thought about you know, what they were going to pack in their little backpack. And, you know, it just was probably a really fun time for them. And yeah, so we traveled to Wyoming every year when my kids were growing up. And my kids would do that. They would pack their backpacks and be ready sitting in the car while we're packing the car. I'm like, get out. You're going to yeah. be in there for 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it for sure. Yeah. And this would have just been a really fun time for everyone. And so um, they go on the road, and they have, I guess, a great time. 
and they'd start traveling home and a couple of days into the travel they realize that Jesus is not with them. Mm -hmm. Now first of all as a mother you're like how could you miss your child for two days but remember that this was way more of a community society than we think of. So I'm sure there were lots of cousins and the kids probably you know some nights they were sleeping in your tent some nights they're sleeping in my tent and so it was not uncommon for the kids to be out running around and them not see them apparently and he's the oldest of yeah the crew i guess probably very dependable right <laughs> this has never happened before right but at some point you just imagine she says joseph have you seen jesus and he's like no actually i haven't have you and then she goes running over to wherever his best friend is and says is Jesus with y'all? No, he's not. We haven't seen him. I, at this point, the panic would set in. Exactly. And so I'm guessing at this point, they probably leave their other kids with the relatives and say, we have to go back. Right. We have to go back and find Jesus. So they go back and they find him and and he has this conversation with his mom. But what, I, you know, when I read this story now, I think of a parenting seminar that I attended with Don McLaughlin, and he used this passage to kind of talk about how Jesus interacts with Mary, because the, the very first interaction when, he, when Mary finds him, he says, uh, well, actually in verse 43, it says, when the feast was ended and they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind, but his parents didn't know it. You know, sometimes I think as a parent, you have this, there's this myth out there that you're supposed to know everything. Mm -hmm. and so here we have the perfect parent of Jesus and they didn't know. So we gotta give ourselves some grace here. <laughs> and so then when they find out, his mom obviously is frustrated, I would be too. And she says, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you and we are in great distress. And so I think another um, thing that we think we're supposed to know, be in control of our kids and know what they're doing. And, and she didn't, they didn't, they did not know what was going on. They were not in control. And so I think there's some grace in here for parents. Mm -hmm. Jesus, um, you know, treats her with respect, says, didn't, you know, I need to be about my father's business that he's with these teachers of the law and they're very impressed with him. Yeah, it says they're impressed with his answers. Yeah. So I guess they were asking questions and he had the answers. And you know, the next thing after he responds, Mary, it just says, and they didn't understand the saying he spoke to them. You know, Mary and Joseph like, we don't get it. Yeah. I'm sure she must have said a lot of times, it's, he's the son of God, I don't get it, you know. <laughs> but for whatever reason, here is the parenting strategy that was recommended. You know, after the parents said, we don't, we don't understand, mm -hmm. then it says, and Jesus went down with them and came to Nazareth. And, you know, that idea of just being with them and traveling with them, uh, you know, sometimes you got to back up and go get Jesus <laughs> and travel together. Right. And so we see a little interaction, and I just think it makes Mary seem real to me. Right. That I'm so glad we had that story. And. Maybe, I wish you'd put a few others in there too, but we get that story of a real interaction of how Jesus was different. Mm -hmm. I'm sure no one else's child had ever stayed to talk. talk. to the teachers. Yeah. Um, and they don't understand, but Jesus is respectful and he goes with them. He doesn't say, well, I have to stay. Right. He goes with them and, and travels on. Um, I think this is interesting because if you... Um, talk about um, the way, because the next story we get about Jesus is when he's an adult mm -hmm. and he is 30. Right. It's about time at that age was the age you had to be if you were going to be a rabbi. We know that Jesus becomes a rabbi. He calls people to follow him. So he's 30. And um, it's interesting if you look at the gospels, Matthew introduces us to Jesus at his baptism and then the temptation with Satan that we talked about last time. And Mark does the same thing, introduces Jesus. The, next, the story we get is the baptism and the temptation. Luke gives us this story of Jesus. So Luke is the only one that tells this story about a young Jesus staying in the temple 
Um, and then he goes straight to the temptation. But John, he, in John, he, he approaches it a little different. He calls the disciples, so we know the disciples have been called to him. They're at this point, you know, it said he called them to be with them, so he, they're with him, hanging around with him. And the next story we get is a wedding. Mm -hmm. And I think that a wedding, again, is a celebration. So we've gone, just looked at Jesus at this festival that they've enjoyed, and now we're gonna go to a wedding. Now, I did a little bit of research about weddings because weddings are different than they are now. Uh, back in Jesus's time, um, most men and women were expected to marry unless they chose to remain celibate to serve God, which we know Jesus did, mm -hmm. Paul did. But if they weren't choosing not to serve God, most of them got married and um, even a lot younger than we do now. Uh, for men, usually more about 18, but for a woman, uh, a lot of times it was just about time when she was 13 or 14 or when she became able to bear children. So a lot younger. Um, most of the time, there, these marriages were arranged by parents, but they weren't seldom forced. Usually the, uh, it was not so much about love or romance, but more about survival, you know, how uh, working together to support the family. And it wasn't just these individuals, it was families that would come together. And so you would make these arrangements with families and, it, and they became uh, close. They also would make an arrangement and then they would have this betrothal, we might call it an engagement, for about a year. And during this year, um, they lived apart, but they knew that they were going to get married. And they would figure out a dowry that the male's family had to give to the wife. And it wasn't so much a, a, a gift just to, because of, to celebrate the marriage, like we think of marriage gifts, but it was more a recognition that the bride's family was about to lose, lose a working member. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I'm sure Mary um, and, you know, all had jobs. And so the, when there was a marriage, the woman would go and live with the husband's family. And so that family of the wife lost a working member. So that dowry was figured out. And then the, when it came time for the marriage, there was, it was a, wasn't just one ceremony like we think about. It started out with a procession of the bridegroom coming with all his friends, his, you know, the house is ready, they've taken this year, they've figured out the dowry, they've prepared a place for them to live with the husband's family, and now he's coming, the bridegroom's coming to, to get his wife, yeah. So she comes, and then the bride gets carried on the little leader, kind of like we would think, or litter, I guess I would say it, of in a procession, and to the groom's house. And she's beautifully dressed, and the people are singing mostly songs from Song of Solomon, what I read. And um, the parents come out and bestow a blessing as she leaves, and she's got her girls with them, and. They're all celebrating as she comes to the home of the groom. But then she goes off with her girls for a while. So that first, I'm assuming it would be a night, she goes off with the girls. And then the next day, there's a big feast, there's more gifts being given, but the men and the women are separate. Until at some point, after dinner, probably the groom comes and there's a, a dialogue between the groom and the bride where they, we would think they actually get married, maybe the ceremony part, um, under a canopy usually, and then the couple leaves to go consummate the marriage and everybody stays. They all stay around and continue this feasting and dancing. At some point, the bride and the groom come back. I don't know if it's that night or the next day, but at some point before everybody leaves, they come back and join the party. And the party extends for maybe even several more days. So it's a big deal. It's an event. It's an event. And I read that most weddings even occurred in the fall time of the year so that it would be cooler and that the harvest would already be in so that they didn't, people could there wasn't jobs, so everybody could come because it was something to celebrate. So we have this 
wedding happening and we get a really good interaction with Jesus and his mom again. So let's read John chapter 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Yeah, so we have this story of a, a wedding feast, and Jesus is just a guest. Right. Um, we couldn't maybe assume that his disciples would be with them, but they're just enjoying the festivities. And all of a sudden, there is a problem because they run out of wine. And that was a big deal um, because of the importance of hospitality to this culture. So, you know, if they run out, the host family looks very inhospitable. They look cheap. Uh, and that was a big deal. So, um, the the wine is run out and Mary comes to Jesus and says the wine is run out mm -hmm. and then Jesus kind of uncharacteristically you know at least if you read it with our ears it sounds like he's being a little sassy like right. well, what does this have to do with me woman you yeah. know <laughs> and so I, you know because of what we know about Jesus we know he's not being sassy um, but he says something interesting here he says my hour has not yet come now this might you might just think well this it's not time for me to step out. But what's interesting about this is that almost every time Jesus talks about his hour coming, he's referring to his death. Mm -hmm. You know, the hour, you know, he prays in the garden, save me from this hour. Or he also says the hour is coming. And so it's odd that... Um, he says, my hour has not come. And Tim Keller has a great sermon on this. If you want to read more about this, I've learned a lot from listening to him talk about this. But he he's kind of says, it's almost like Mary says, they're running out of wine. This is terrible. And Jesus says, why are you bothering me? I'm not ready to die. And then Mary says, don't listen to him, to the servants. He's acting weird, but just do whatever he says. And so, you know, it's kind of, and, and so Jesus goes and he tells the servants, after first saying, I'm not going to do anything, he honors his mother and he tells the servants to go get the water and to serve the water that is in these ritual containers. Now, I'm a mathematics teacher and so the numbers were kind of interesting to me. So I looked up, because it tells us how much these containers held. Mm -hmm. And so it, it would have, there were six of them, and they each held 20 gallons. So that would have been 120 gallons, which if you want to break that down into an 8-ounce cup, <laughs> that's 1,920 cups of wow. wine. That's a uh, lot of yes. wine. So, you know, Jesus... And, and we find out not only is it that much, but it's quality. Right. So we've got quantity and we've got quality. Uh, and, and then the party continues. Um, so there's so much I want us to unpack here a little bit. But first of all, this is, it says, and this is Jesus' first miracle. Yeah. And I think that that is a little bit odd. You know, like his first miracle is not to feed 5,000 starving people or to heal a blind man or mm -hmm. it's, it's to give people more wine, you know. Right. So they think... It's already had a lot of wine. Yeah. And you never, ever again see Jesus performing 
a miracle. You see him performing a miracle to provide food for people. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like this, at a wedding that you think, what's going to happen if they don't have wine? They go home and they feel bad about the host. Well, no, th- this was a big deal. But you think, is there more going on here? You know, what is, why would Jesus choose this to be his very first miracle? And, you know, I, I think Tim Keller brings up a great point. He says, we, it's startling for us because we think there's so much pain in the world. Why wouldn't he do a miracle to reduce someone's pain, you know, like we see him go on to do for the rest of the Gospels? But he says, maybe Jesus is setting, a, there's a parable. You know, he's trying to, usually there's more that meets the eye. He says, maybe the problem is not so much the presence of pain, but the absence of joy. And Jesus says, you know, and, and in this case, wine represents a lot of times joy. Right. You know, if you read some of the Proverbs, it'll say, may this house have wine, that joy may always abound, you know. or So it, if wine is representing joy, the, the problem at this wedding is the joy has run out. Mm-hmm. And when Jesus says, my hour hasn't come, it's almost like he's saying, the wine always runs out. You know, on this life, the wine is always going to run out. Um, you know, you you think, oh, if I could just make it to this point where I get through with school, everything's going to be great. Or if I could just find someone to marry and start a family, it'll be great. Or if we could just buy our own house. And the more life you live, the more you realize that while those bring some joy, it, it doesn't ever last. Right. There's always, you know, Tim Keller likes to say it's the bear went over up the mountain to see what he could see, and all he could see was the other side of the mountain. Mm-hmm. That the wine always runs out. And yet Jesus knows that the only way for us to have lasting joy is for him to die. You know, he says later in John, I've come that you might have joy to the full. Right. And the only way that's going to happen is for him to die. And so he alludes to that when he talks about the hour coming. But, you know, in, in, our, in our world where we live in, where it's so many times things don't bring us fulfillment that we think, there, there's, there's temptation. Um, again, this is, this is Tim Keller's teaching that he says, you know, we can blame things. We can say, well, if I just had a better job, I would be have joy. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we might even say, if I had a different spouse, or if I lived in a different town, or if I had a new, new scenery, new career, we blame something. This right. is why I'm not joyful. Or you could blame yourself. You could just say, well, I'm not very good. If I could, I'll just try harder. It's my problem. But that doesn't satisfy either. And then you know, if you've You're still running not joyful and you've blamed everything. You can't blame yourself. Sometimes you can blame just the universe, just just life. This is the bear on the other side of the mountain. That's all there is. And you become bitter. And, you know, it's just not fun to be around anyone like that where this life sucks kind of person. But the other option that you have is to blame separation from God. And that idea that until our heart finds what we were made for, we're going to have that. You know, C.S. Lewis is famous for saying, if your heart longs for something that seems to be unfulfilled in this world, it must mean that we were made for some different world. Mm -hmm. And that idea that we were made to be with God and that He is the person who can help us receive that. So I also think it's interesting that when, um, you know, in this story, he, Jesus tells them to use these jars, which were the jars that held, you would call them purification jars. So they would, you could wash the water that would get, help you, your hands going from being unclean to unclean or your, you know, to make you ceremonial clean, you use this water. And so this wine could symbolize, as he makes it to wine, it could symbolize his blood that makes us also clean. 
You know, so Jesus, in some ways, could be thought of saying, I've come to bring you a joy, an everlasting joy. But it was sad for him because he knows that for us to be able to sip that joy, he's going to have to sip the sorrow of going to the cross. Um, but how do you, how do we, so what do we do? I think Mary gives us the answer, um, and that is do whatever he says. Do whatever he says. Right. Um, and so we see Mary telling him that, and um, it's such a nice picture that we have from Mary, even though, you know, we're reading more into the story, but usually with Jesus, there was some reason for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do get one other glimpse of Mary. She pops up a few times. Uh, you know, she and the brothers go visit Jesus when they think he's crazy. They're going to go help him. And he says, those aren't my mother and brothers, right. which would have hurt mm-hmm. as well. Um, but there's another time we see Mary, and that's at the cross. Um, you know, Mary, Jesus is always asking, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Um, and people get credit. Peter gets credit of saying who you are. Martha gets credit. But I think Mary always knew. Yeah. She always knew what was going to happen. And... For whatever reason, Jesus is dying on the cross, and Mary's allowed to watch that too. She's there for the whole process. We don't get to see her after the resurrection, although I'm sure that was a wonderful mm-hmm. hug. Right. <laughs> and I'm sure her eyes long to see that. But I want us to read in John, in, um, John again, chapter 19, 25 through 27. This is Jesus on the cross. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to this disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. I think this gives us some insight into Jesus, too, that his almost his last thought as a human mm-hmm. is to care for his mother. And, you know, we live in a society that does not honor older people as much as the Middle East culture. And I, I think that's to our shame. I don't know that that's very good. Um, but Jesus, even though he had brothers, he looks at Mary and looks at John. And, and what's one of his last thoughts is, take care of my mother. This is your mother from now on. Right. Uh, And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thought. Um, So I don't know. I just think it's very interesting to think about Jesus had a mother. And it speaks to us as women, I think, to be able to see that she's there all the way from the beginning to the end. Yeah. And, you know, his her sister was with her. Which is so sweet of God. Yeah. To know that she needed somebody. I just love that. Mm -hmm. You have a sister. I have a sister. I think how comforting that would be to just have someone that knows you to stand there with you. She wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there were two other Marys there, too. So even her best friends were probably there with her. Yeah. So, and then you just want to say, hang on, Mary. Hang on three days. Right. Um, It's going to get better. But I love that we see Jesus interact with his mother she seems to push him into the ministry. Mm-hmm. And um, she knew timing. <laughs> she had that timing, and she maybe had learned, like we heard her say in Jerusalem, I don't understand this. Right. Maybe by the time he was at the wedding, she was like, I still don't understand this, but do whatever he says. <laughs> It'll work out. Right. Uh, so we, we can follow that advice from Mary. Um, we can follow Jesus' example to love and honor our parents, and we can follow Jesus' uh, or Mary's example to do whatever Jesus says. Thanks for listening and journeying with us on this side of the ceiling. See you next time.